So, uh, my name is Christian Fisher, uh, and I'm talking about uh, my experience of writing a uh, genetics browser using PureScript uh, without me, without actually having any domain knowledge or expertise. So, yeah, I wrote a genetics browser, and uh, if you guys don't know what a genetics browser is, that's perfect because I didn't know either. Uh, like I said, I don't have any genetics training, so this was really like a layman's approach to a pretty uh, complicated problem. Uh, and I, uh, by using PureScript as the implementation language, I was able to leverage some, uh, some of the language features to work as a kind of scaffolding that makes up for the uh, lacking expertise of, uh, yeah, the exp expertise I lacked. Uh, so, a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm from Umeå, Sweden, a little town in northern Sweden. Uh, as for reference, uh, it's about two degrees further north than Anchorage, Alaska, so that's about it. <laughs> uh, so, I studied uh, computer science and interaction design at uh, Umeå University. Um, and I got into this field uh, by being a Google Summer of Code student three years ago. Uh, and uh, that path has uh, brought me to the uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, where I am now. Uh, I moved there to Memphis uh, two months ago. So uh, to give you a, an idea of the actual problem um, and the project. So at UTHSC, uh, one project they have is Gene Network, which is a uh, an open source uh, web uh, resource and uh, data analysis toolkit, essentially. Um, it's open source and uh, you can go check it out at gnetwork.org if you want to. Uh, so one thing that gnetwork lacks is uh, a genome browser, which is essentially a tool that lets you explore genomic data, any kind of data that is associated with a genome. Um, so my summer code project was to uh, embed a uh, genome browser in G-Network. And uh, we first decided to use uh, BioDalliance, which is an existing genome browser. Uh, and BioDalliance was chosen because it, is, uh, it was the smallest, cleanest, and easiest to work with of those that we looked at. And that, that doesn't... It's kind of bad that that's the case because it's a 10-year-old project or even more. It's 40,000 lines of JavaScript and uh, it's not really, yeah, it took me a summer to, I spent a summer refactoring it and made it way better, but still not good enough. So after the summer, me and my mentor decided that uh, it would be better if I just wrote my own. And uh, I was allowed to choose whatever language I wanted to and uh, PureScript seemed interesting, so that's what I did. So to give you guys an idea of the scale of the problem a genome browser needs to uh, solve. So the mouse genome has 19 autosomes. That is, uh, autosomes are all the chromosomes that aren't sex chromosomes. Uh, and each uh, autosome has between 60 and 200 million uh, base pairs or nucleotides. Uh, in a given uh, data set, we can have tens of thousands of data points and uh, um, so you can imagine that the, it's uh, quite a lot of the data to deal with, especially if it's going to be an interactive and fluid experience. Uh, so here's a picture of the browser, but I'll uh, do one thing better and actually uh, show a demo. So uh, this is the browser I've created. So you see along the x-axis uh, are the 19 autosomes. And, uh, Along the y-axis is the negative base 10 logarithm of uh, p-value, which is essentially the number of c point zero zero zero, that many zeros. Uh, and uh, the p-value in this case is whether one of these data points, and these data points correspond to something that can vary at a, at a single nucleotide across individuals. So in one mouse it might be a G, in another mouse it might be a C. Uh, and uh, if 
and uh, when you uh, measure a trait such as body weight across many individuals and then genotype those individuals, you can find that uh, some of these SNPs, uh, as they're called, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are associated with a difference in the uh, trait. So if we say that uh, we've measured body weight, in this case, uh, we'd see that here on chromosome 17, there's something going on because there's a lot of differences there that are correlated with a difference in the phenotype. So uh, if I scroll the mouse wheel up and down, I can zoom in and out, and then I can click and drag to pan the view, or I can also use the uh, arrow keys. So let's take a little bit of a closer look here. So these uh, things above the, above the data points are annotations, and that's essentially any kind of additional data that we know, uh, some more information that we have about these points on the genome. So if I zoom in a bit further, I can click on SNPs that are significant and get this little extra info here. So here we see that uh, at this point in the genome, uh, there's a gene called CCHCR1. And if I click on this URL, uh, I go out to this external resource, which is called Uniprot, which has all this kind of uh, protein and data that here we can see that uh, at that point in the mouse genome, there's something that regulates this stuff. So back to the slides. So this is the, oh, that's not. So this is what the talk's gonna look like. So I've already gone through the project background and the demo, so the, for the remainder, I'll be showing some of the bigger problems I've had, or the bigger, like, yeah, problems that I've had to solve and how I kind of managed to solve them. Uh, and then I'll be uh, showing some optimizations that I had to do because uh, my initial solution was not uh, quite performant enough. So, uh, so the single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is that's all the dots you saw as, except for the annotations. And a SNP has essentially two parts. It has a position on the genome and it has a p-value. So the question then becomes, how do we go from a position on the genome and a p-value onto the canvas? And the p-value is simple because that's just a regular, you just need to perform a regular transformation on that. But the genome is a bit more tricky it's because the thing is the genome is split up into chromosomes and base pairs while the canvas is just a regular line. So you can't, so there's not actually a, an obvious or natural uh, isomorphism between the two. So my first, uh, where my first uh, approach was to think of the canvas as a window into the genome. And uh, I expressed that with uh, these types. So uh, yeah, a chromosome is just, the chromosome that is a chromosome name is just a string. And then a base pair I just treat as an integer. And then window is a pair of a tuple and a chromosome and a base pair. And a pair, this pair type is just, a tuple that has the same uh, type for both uh, entries. So what happens if we try this, if we use this as the basis for our uh, transformation from genome to screen? Well, first we can get a view scale by dividing the canvas width in pixels by the number of by the size of the window, which is essentially the number of base pairs vis visible. And then we can define the exposition on the canvas as the distance between the exposition on the genome and the left-hand side of the window times the scale. Does that make sense? Good. So this looks pretty simple, but it's actually more complex than it seems because for one thing, uh, the distance function must take the uh, chromosome sizes into account. And uh, it turns out that this works 
but um, there are uh, some problems. So one thing is that it's too complex under the hood. And uh, one of the reasons that it is so complex is that there's a lot of implicit assumptions, like we assume that we could just take the distance between two points in the genome, but it doesn't actually make sense necessarily to take the distance between one point on one chromosome and another point on another chromosome. And the biggest problem is that um, there's, using this method, there's no way to add a visible padding between the, uh, between the chromosomes. So here, uh, here you see that there is some padding between the chromosomes and you want that because otherwise it just bleeds together and it gets ugly. So uh, my next attempt to allow for this padding was to make things explicit. And I did that by, uh, st by simply squashing the genome into a single line uh, using these types then. Uh, so a browser coordinate is just some point on the genome, on the squashed genome, and a window is two points. And note I have to use the big int type here because the sum of the sizes of the autosomes of just mouse is 2.4 billion, and the uh, int in, in PureScript is a, it's a JavaScript number underneath, but JavaScript numbers can uh, express 32-bit integers. That's the max uh, if you want to be safe and use integers and not floats. So I had to actually use big ints to, uh, to express that. So this, uh, using this, the tr uh, transformation it looks pretty much the same as uh, last time, but um, the, for one thing, the distance calculation is simplified because now we actually explicitly state that you can take the distance between two points on the genome. So um, the good, one of the good parts of this is that um, if we, uh, before we, or while we're squashing the uh, chromosomes or the genome, if we remember where each chromosome is on the line, we can then uh, put in padding between them. And actually, now it's possible to actually add padding. And uh, this is what that, uh, the type of that uh, function looks like. So we take a radius to pad each chromosome with in uh, big ends, and then a, uh, an array of the chromosomes and their sizes, and then we get uh, the total padded, a little bit bigger than the real genome uh, size, and the chromosomes, which is a uh, map to their, a map from the chromosome name to their interval on this squashed line. Uh, and yeah, like I said, it becomes easy to calculate distances, and it uh, kind of sort of works out. But uh, there are some other problems with this. so. For one is that now, not only, now it's actually still two steps to, or even maybe even more if you, depending on how you think about it, to perform this transformation. So first you need to squash the genome, and then you need to transform each SNP uh, into uh, the squashed genome, and then you need to go from the squashed genome onto the canvas. And that works, but it's clunky. And another pro problem is that if you change the padding, you need to re update the entire coordinate system. Uh, and we want to change the padding because the padding here was given in big ints, but uh, the padding is only supposed to be visual, so I actually want to provide it in pixels. So if I zoom in and out, I need to uh, change the entire coordinate system. These calculations aren't expensive, but uh, it just adds complexity and it's tricky to maintain and extend. So how can we uh, solve this then? So the main problem is that we've been uh, working at this, uh, looking at this problem from a canvas point of view. We've been trying to fit the genome into the canvas, but that clearly doesn't work. So how about we flip things around and instead think about uh, trying to fit the canvas into the, onto the genome. And this uh, 
actually seems to work out. So first, let me clarify some of the types. So here I just uh, have some uh, type aliases. So pixel is just a number, a uh, JavaScript number. A uh, coordinate system is uh, this uh, map from chromosome names to their sizes. And then this segment is a map from chromosomes to pixel intervals corresponding to where that chromosome is going to be drawn on the canvas. So with uh, working from these types, we can uh, pretty easily come up with a, the uh, types of functions to uh, create these padded intervals to uh, draw padded uh, chromosomes onto the canvas. Uh, so this first function, scaled segments, takes a, yeah, it takes like, for example, it takes any, I just, uh, this is just, I could be, a, should be a chromosome here, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it takes uh, these chromosome sizes and a, both a pixel width and a, uh, the, uh, the pixel width of the um, canvas and uh, the si window width. And it returns this, the uh, intervals as if they were just uh, one after another, not padded. But then we can have this, use this other function, pixel segments, which just takes this, the result of the scaled segments and then just uh, squeezes them together just a little bit so that uh, they get a little bit less space to uh, get drawn into, uh, but um, they're still centered at the same space, same point, so now we have padding. And uh, putting this uh, stuff together, uh, this is the function type of the actual render snips function, which transforms all the data into stuff that can be drawn to the canvas. So I just have this uh, point here, which is just a X and a Y on the canvas. The SNPs, the SNP data divided by chromosome, the pixel intervals, I just uh, showed you how I create, and then the size of the canvas, because we still need to be able to, uh, yeah, that's just needed to um, scale the uh, Y coordinates correctly. And then we get a return a, an array of points and drawings. So an array of drawings and where to draw them. And the drawing here uh, comes from the uh, PureScript drawing library, which is a, uh, which provides a nice and simple uh, monoidal uh, drawing uh, type. Yeah. Does that mean you're not using any native JavaScript libraries for the drawing? Um, so the drawing library provides a render function that takes a canvas context and a drawing and draws it to the canvas. So, okay, so you're, you're, okay. you're relying on the existing PureScript library to do that? Um, yes, but I'm, I'll also show some more stuff later, but I do actually use uh, the canvas directly also. Uh, and here, actu here is actually the uh, definition of the drawing for a SNP. So it's just a circle centered at the origin because we provide the points in a different way uh, with this radius and these colors. And in the real code, uh, those, all those values are uh, taken from a user-provided configuration. Uh, so to summarize this section, uh, non-isomorphic coordinate systems are tricky. Um, and if a, con a transformation feels contrived, it probably is. So one thing that can help you is kind of trying to keep things natural. So uh, you can change your system, but you can't change your input data. And that might sound weird because most of programming is just transforming input data. But, um, but the thing is that you still have this input data that you need to deal with. And in a case like a of a visualization tool, the structure of the data that you have is actually one of the most important parts. So if, you ha if the data you have has some inherent structure, you should consider using it. One problem is uh, that uh, in many cases, the inherent structure in the data you have is the structure that some smart-ass programmer came up with. 
but in my case, I, it was evolution that came up with it, so I'm pretty confident in using it. So next is the process of annotating these SNPs. So annotations are, in general, extra position-specific information. And uh, some examples of that information is the name of a gene, uh, URIs to external resources, uh, aliases, because of course genes have pro usually have like five or ten different names because scientists. Uh, and yeah, this is yes, a reminder of what the info box looks like. And so these things are specifically uh, annotations. And um, it's, oh, well, no, there. So what does the pipeline kind of look like? First, we want to somehow connect the annotation data set we have to the SNPs. Then we want to group them by pixel distance and uh, then render them. So uh, just as a reminder here, this is what I mean by grouping them. So we can, we have actually many more annotations here than SNPs, but that's just because of the zoom level we're at now. So this is just a, visual uh, little touch. So, um, oh god damn it. Uh, one of the trickier parts here is that, well, we are, we've already solved the genome position problem, but here the issue is that uh, annotations can contain all kinds of data, but they don't in of themselves provide the required um, data for uh, to show uh, to tell us where to draw them uh, vertically because that actually depends on what else is on the screen with them what other snips they are so we need to uh, define what the y coordinate is for these annotations so my first attempt was to take the maximum uh, y pixel coordinate or of the snips that are close enough to the annotation and this is roughly what that looked like uh, first. So close enough, I just defined to be within one million base pairs. And then I actually add this score field to, uh, or I add the, I take the score of the SNPs in, the, in that area and I add that to the data use, to the annotation data. Um, and if you remember what I talked about five minutes ago or three minutes ago, you might remember that that's probably not a good idea. So some of the problems is that it's arbitrary and inflexible. Like why should it just be, why should the radius be one million base pairs? Why should it look at the score specifically of another data set and add that to this data set? That doesn't make sense, especially not if you consider what we're actually, what the uh, annotations actually are supposed to be. So the y coordinate of an annotation actually depends on the SNPs that look close, not just within some arbitrary base pair distance of them. And uh, like I uh, said earlier, you don't want to, or as a, to expand on what I said earlier. You don't want to modify the data to change the view, and that's pretty obvious if you've done like any web programming or whatever. That I mean, it's nonsensical often. So now we can think about how we solve this in the last section. Is there any structure that we, we can leverage here? So there is, but uh, there, it's not like last time. Last time we had the genome as the structure. Here we actually have what the application, uh, what we want the app to do as, that's our structure. So uh, in words, the structure we have for annotations is actually a collection of things around some significant value. So it's a collection of things on a, around something and it has a significant value that is the, uh, like the height of the thing. And we can express that at a, as a type in PureScript like this. So a peak is a, uh, covers some area, some area on some type or some uh, coordinate. It has a Y value of possibly another coordinate and it has a collection of elements uh, contained within the peak. So uh, 
this then is one peak. And if I zoom closer in, they become more peaks. So how do we construct these peaks? And this is the type of the function used in the code. So uh, this is uh, used, this constructs the peaks for a single uh, chromosome and then just to do it over the entire genome, we just uh, use regular function map. Um, so one interesting thing here is that uh, the radius is still provided in base pairs, but this isn't actually a problem because we can call peaks with a radius determined from the uh, current zoom level. And that's how we do it here. So uh, frame size is the size of the uh, chromo of the chromosome in uh, pixels, I think. And uh, yeah, and pair size is the chromosome size, but it doesn't really matter. And four here is just the uh, radius of the uh, SNP circle. So uh, here we go. We have a, now using this, the peaks uh, are actually calculated from what is visible. Uh, and rendering these uh, peaks and annotations, uh, well, the function looks, okay, the first type there is a bit wrong, but. Uh, the function looks essentially like the uh, render SNP one, but uh, it actually takes both the SNP data set and the annotations data set, and then the pixel intervals and the canvas size. So this might look pretty uh, inefficient, because at first glance it might look like it's actually going through all the data every time it has a re-render, but uh, under the hood it's actually like these four uh, these, uh, when you provide these three arguments, it just does all the calculation necessary and then returns a function. So it's kind of thunking there. And that's just by doing, returning a lambda. So to summarize here, um, just like before, uh, you want to change your system, not your data. So in this case, uh, we thought about what we actually want the application to do. And uh, that's another type of structure that you can have and be able to leverage. And of course, uh, it's always good to keep things simple. Next is user interaction, specifically the uh, require uh, the um, the process of clicking on a data point and then fi fi or clicking on something on the canvas and finding the data points that corresponds to the drawings on the canvas. Like so. So the um, naive solution would be to simply search the input data and that would we could do that by um, using filter map to transform each uh, point, uh, each data point into a canvas point and then compare the distance. And uh, that's kind of clunky, especially if you do it like I did the obvious way first, which is to uh, actually passing the entire data set to the UI, which like does the uh, canvas rendering. So um, you do, you have to pass that entire data set and do this transformation every time the user might have clicked on a SNP. So obviously that's not great. And a better solution is to just remember uh, what will we have to work with? Well, we actually already have all the points calculated. They're exactly the same points that we used to choose where to draw the, the data points on the canvas. So um, we can just modify render the render snips function to not only return a list of all the things to draw and where to draw them, but also uh, return the uh, snips and their points. But we can do one thing better. We can actually make it return a search function. And uh, yeah, let me show you the code for that. And this is straight out of uh, the implementation. So uh, given the snips and their points and a radius and a point on the canvas, we return uh, the snips that overlap with that point. 
and that's just here we have the filter map I mentioned earlier, uh, and it just compares the radiuses, uh, the points, and checks if they're close enough to a given radius. And we change render snips to return a record. So the output of render snips now looks like this. We have drawings and we have this hotspots function that returns the, that is the search function. And uh, annotations are done uh, in the same way. So uh, again, we leverage some structure to solve this problem. Um, this time the structure we leveraged was actually the structure of our program. So you can kind of think of the uh, interface of your code as more structure that you're working with. Uh, so now there's just one little thing left. Uh, you saw that the browser was pretty fast. It wasn't always. It was 30 seconds per frame at one point in time. Uh, so here are some optimizations that I'm going to step through. Batch rendering, uh, using better data structures, asynchronous rendering. Uh, yeah. So for the batch rendering, uh, we noticed that all the SNPs are identical. You saw the definition of the drawing, and that's the same one for every SNP on the screen. So we can just render them once uh, and then uh, render one SNP once and then just copy that to every place on the canvas, and that's quite a bit faster. Uh, so instead of, so this is what the render SNPs uh, function then returns on the uh, drawing uh, field. It's just a drawing and a set of points where to draw it. Uh, and the peer script part of this batch rendering looks like this. We have a render glyphs function which takes a, an off-screen canvas, the visible canvas context, the uh, visible uh, pixel, uh, the visible pixel interval, because uh, if you zoom in, the entire genome still uh, has a pixel or have pixel coordinates, but they may be outside the visible uh, canvas. Uh, and then the, it takes a drawing and a, set a list of points on to draw them to. Here, the, we use the drawing uh, uh, library's render function to render it to the off-screen, uh, to render the glyph to the off-screen off canvas. Here, we actually create a predicate that um, filters out, or is going to use to filter out all the uh, SNPs that are outside the uh, screen. Uh, and here, we just use the, um, here we call a, a JavaScript function, actually. And the JavaScript function we call uh, looks like this. So it's pretty simple. You just, we just uh, run the predicate. And if the point we're going to draw is actually visible, we just uh, copy the uh, image from the, uh, uh, we copy the uh, part from the off-screen canvas onto the visible canvas. And then, yeah. And I also, uh, I think, this, uh, this uh, division actually does some, made things a little bit faster because I don't know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is actually like a pretty simple JavaScript uh, for such a specific optimization. Just, I mean, if you have to write JavaScript, uh, six lines is a decent amount, I think. So. Uh, the main pipeline of the render snips and render annotations and that uh, consists of just folds and unfolds. We fold the, we uh, map over the snips to get the, uh, to find the points and then we build up the rendered list uh, or stuff, list of things to render and so on. Uh, originally I used a pure script array type because that just felt reasonable when I was still playing around with uh, doing things uh, manual in JavaScript with a canvas because the pure script array uh, is the JavaScript array. But the thing is that pure script is immutable. So when you're working with arrays, whenever you make any change in, to an array in pure script, the entire array has to be copied. 
So if you have 10,000 data points and you're folding over that, each step of the fold is a new, is a cloned array. Uh, so this was probably the biggest uh, speed up, or at least for how easy it was to implement because thanks to the PureScript type system, you, I essentially just had to change from array to list and, may, and then change one or two f functions here and there. So uh, this change took probably like 30 minutes to an hour to implement, but it was a thousand percent speed up. So uh, pretty good uh, bang for the buck there. And the last uh, optimization I'll show is um, asynchronous rendering. And uh, this is something that should have been difficult, but actually really wasn't. So uh, here's the entire bit that does the asynchronous rendering. So before it was asynchronous, it was just this little bit. So all I do here is actually chunk up all the things that I render to the screen. Uh, and then I just uh, for uh, or traverse them. Uh, and I do this in the uh, uh, asynchronous effect monad in PureScript. So I just, I mean, I get everything for free. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so to conclude, uh, you want to stick to the domain. And the thing is that even, uh, even though I didn't have any, the, like the domain expertise that I thought I needed to accomplish this, I still had something to kind of stick some hooks into and start uh, climbing a wall on. Like, uh, like. So uh, in this case, I had the genome uh, structure. So I had the domain in that way that I had a genome, I had a structure, I had something to work from, from there. Uh, and uh, other than that, it's, um, you want to obviously iterate like crazy. So the thing that PureScript really helps you with here is that it makes it so easy to do that, to actually iterate and throw out everything that didn't work and just keep whatever it is that did work, even if what did work is just a little bit or even some kind of architectural thing that's almost too abstract to actually point out in the code, but it's still possible to keep that and just throw out what's outside and inside that. Uh, and uh, another thing is that um, I've probably rewritten the entire browser and now by now it's a few thousand lines long. I've rewritten the whole damn thing uh, probably five times. <laughs> but every time I could, every time as soon as the thing compiled, it worked as good or better than it did before. And that's really the biggest advantage, I think, of using a, a language like yeah, PureScript. Uh, and that's uh, it. So I do anybody have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, so in this case, um, the example was when doing this transformation uh, from the genome to the canvas. So the unnatural part of that was really uh, having to squash and like uh, kind of uh, kind of destroy the structure despite me actually having to keep the structure because I still had to, uh, you know, render the chromosomes padded and visible as chromosomes. So in my first attempts, I had to destroy the structure and then recreate it. And it's just, yeah, so by natural, I guess I mean, just uh, if it feels like you're doing something that goes against the, either the data or the uh, semantics of the application, I guess. No. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so I did have to do a, like a bunch of smaller optimizations to make sure that um, the garbage collector doesn't mess things up too much, but it's, it's really just uh, profiling the code and looking at where things are going wrong. So it's nothing specific really, you just have to kind of look at, yeah, profiler code. Yeah. Uh, so I'm actually probably going to have to implement that because one thing Biodalian supports is exporting um, into SVG, which is very useful when you know you have scientists who want to make publications, but um, not not yet, no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so I do some um, optimizations like that also. Like um, when I, uh, whenever you, things actually only get re-rendered uh, when you zoom in. So then it's like uh, the actual canvas is much wider than what's visible. So things don't only need to be re-rendered if there's like uh, something that's, uh, if you try to look at something that's not already rendered. Well, all right. Uh, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>